Well, good morning, everyone. Um, what I wanted to try to do with, you know, maybe giving a little bit of a Western theme to it is uh, take a look at how has Airborne EM been utilized to provide information on drilling. I've got about 10 years worth of examples, several different systems. So I'll show you some of the, the good, the ugly, and the bad. And of course, I'm going to start with more good, and we'll get smaller and smaller to the bad. It is an Airborne EM conference. But uh, uh, Jim Kanya, Ted Ash, and Katie Cameron uh, all helped and put this together. So notice, Andrea, I used the original movie poster. Yes. But I have the, uh, the Gringo one, too. <laughs> So um, drilling wanderers using Airborne EM is a, is a little similar to this movie. Not ev everything appears clear. Things get a little blurry between the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, I'll, I'll bring you along with this. And I hope everyone's seen the movie, all right? Four or five times, maybe. So what, what is this concept of successful groundwater exploration. What, what, what is that? Well, it's meeting your quality to what people want. So in some situations, that is lots of water, clean water for drinking. But in other situations, an example from some of the oil field for fracking water, they don't want potable water. They want water in between 2,500 and 4,000 TDS. That's not something you can grow with and it's not very good to drink. So it's, it's finding that balance between what's successful is meeting the client's needs. So an obvious key in the airborne is ability of the groundwater expression, electrical resistivity contrasts between areas of the aquifer with the desirable characteristics and the ones without the desirable characteristics. So this is uh, another example of the slide that uh, Greg uh, showed earlier. Uh, so we have this range in resistivity, but we have these modeling challenges. We saw some of that yesterday. Can we see everything? You know, we have smooth models. Can we see thin layers, et cetera? There's, there's limitations to what airborne EM can do. So what is it that goes into an AM sur a airborne EM survey? And we've hit on some of this so far, but it's important. I'm not going to dwell on these, but I need to acknowledge them. It, system bandwidth, is it frequency domain, time domain, uh, fixed wing, helicopter, uh, calibration, data space, model space, where does that happen, how is it done, flight planning, line spacing, the directions of the lines, spacing in between the lines. Wade just showed us the difference in the resolution. Infrastructure, power lines, spherics, all the things that go in to make an airborne EM successful. Processing, removing in coupling, not removing coupling, averaging, filtering, stacking, calibrate, all of that goes into there. Inversion, we saw some different inversions. Is it 1D, 2D, deterministic, stochastic, all of those are parts. But what it really comes down to is the interpretation, and I hope to bring that to you today is you need to use a geologic model, lithology, geophysical logs, water quality, aquifer testing. And as we go through this good, the bad, the ugly, it really kind of, how are you using the airborne EM with its limitations to come up with a successful well? So the systems we're gonna talk about today are uh, the Fugro, CGG, Resolve, uh, that's from 2008, so it was Fugro when we flew it there. Greg helped with that survey. Uh, Sky Tim, uh, 304 from 2013, 304M from 2018, Sky Tim 5, 508 from 14 and 15, and the Geotech V10 Plus from 2017. So good. Let's start there. We always want to start on a positive. The drilling was able to meet the requirements based on the AEM interpretation. So I'm going to start with an example uh, from Western Nebraska. And it's one that uh, I met Wade Cress because John had to go overseas, John Lane. So I went to help Wade Cress in Western Nebraska and met Jim Kenya 
on this very flight line. So we're looking to determine the depth of the quaternion alluvium for input into a groundwater model. That's the goal. That's why we're, we're there. So we've got quaternion alluvium. We've got some groundwater, coarse gravel sitting on this White River Group Brule Formation, which is the aquaclude in the area. So we used uh, the Resolve and the UBC 1D FM code for the inversion. So this is a portion of the profile that I think you guys saw twice yesterday from uh, Morrill, uh, Nebraska. And let me explain it here. So the bright colors are high resistivity. Uh, the blue down here is uh, low resistivity. Um, and this, uh, at this point, I think Burke did these inversions for us at the time. Uh, we cut it off kind of below the DOI estimate at the time. So a little story behind this. Uh, Wade Cress and I were sitting up here doing some uh, seismic and resistivity right at this point. And we say, Jim, can you? Yeah, yeah. Hey, the bedrock doesn't come up here. It's a big pile of gravel. I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. So we flew an airborne EM survey a few years later, and we get this huge resistor here. It's like, hey, that's not the bedrock. It's sand and gravel. So Jim said, I don't think so. We're going to drill a hole. Okay, let's drill a hole. So we drilled a hole, and uh, the, uh, the blue colors are, are clays and silts, and uh, the bright colors are sands and gravels. So they come down here, hit a little silt layer. See, I told you it's a bedrock. I said, no, Jim, keep going. Drilled some more, bunch of sand and gravel and consolidated. Hit another silt layer. We're at the bottom. No, Jim, keep going. Went down through here, finally hit the brule down here. So this was a, a big positive understanding of the area. And a, and a good. This, was, this worked. This was a positive. A good. Let's go to the Central Valley of California. Uh, whole idea is finding a water well uh, with, with good flow, low TDS, um, and uh, we're looking at quaternary fill, tertiary fill over the Cretaceous bedrock. Um, so this was done with the 508, uh, 2015, Aarhus workbench. And this is uh, an example that Ted presented at uh, Sajeep 2017, I think. So the top pane is uh, resistivity, high is, is uh, um, the pink colors, but that's 30 ohm meters to show that. We have some boreholes in the area, borehole logs. Uh, we've converted to a lithology change down here. Here's the Sierra Nevada batholith and some wells in here. And this was the target area. And the target area was in this, this uh, area, not, I mean, 10, 10 to 15 ohm meters, not what you'd say, but that's uh, the best guess in the area of where we could go. So, of course, this agricultural group, they prefer not to be named, went out and drilled a hole. So drilling the hole, this was uh, the pump test they got for the area. And I know these can be uh, used and abused, but the point is, is we had good pumping. There's still some groundwater withdrawal. They had water at 700 uh, TDS. Success, a good, right? Okay. Cheyenne, Wyoming. Jumping around the country here. Uh, the goal was determine the location of the depth of aquifer as a conduit for contamination, quaternary and tertiary Ogallala sitting over that tertiary White River um, system again, which is an aquaclude, so aquifer over aquaclude. Okay, uh, this is 2017 304M. We used the workbench again. So a little idea on where we did this. This is with uh, RMC and AMEC, Foster Wheeler, and the Army Corps of Engineers. Of course, any contaminant study has to have two or three different groups involved. Um, this is the, uh, the sounding points here, the blue dots. This is one section here. Uh, that's where the Corps decided to drill the hole, right in between where we had data, of course. So how were we at predicting this? And uh, it's not too far away. It's 670 feet uh, versus 680 feet away. So this is a complicated plot, but let me walk you through it. So here is the actual lithology. Uh, the light colors are sands and gravels. Uh, we move into the greens or conglomerates. Uh, there's no sample right at the interface and moving into clays, some sand layers. Uh, in this area is where 
the picks from the Airborne EM and the picks from the, the, the two soundings closest and the Airborne EM were and where the contact from the drilling was. So uh, success, how did it match the resistivity? We have the short and long normal resistivity logs, the red and the brown or the two sounding curves. So we do see some differences over that 1200 feet, but the bottom was successful. Everyone's happy. If everyone's happy, it's good. So as we're moving through this kind of gradation, let's go to an example in Eastern North Dakota, the Red River Valley. Um, the idea, can we see the depth of the Caturnia aquifers for groundwater availability for the state of North Dakota? This is quaternary deposits sitting on top of Precambrian granites. In this example, uh, the VHM Plus was used, a 2017 version, and we used the Aarhus workbench. So here's an example. Let me walk you through this. This is just where the line is. All these white spots in here, lots of coupling, and lots of culture. You can see right where the roads are, because you can only drill holes where roads are. Um, the pink is high resistivity in excess of 100 ohm meters, and you know, way off scale there. And the blue is low resistivity here. So there we have a clay layer at the top, uh, a green layer in here, which is, happens to be our sands and gravels, sitting on top of this bedrock high resistivity unit. However, I know this will surprise everyone. This, to me, this is starting to look a little fuzzy. You know, we're red, pink, yellow. Where is those colors pulling in there? We did successfully pull out the, the bedrock in the area, but we're starting to get into that fuzzy zone, and it's because of our contrasts. We're not able to see gravel derived from the Precambrian sitting on top of the Precambrian as well as we'd like in some of the other examples. Again, this is starting to get a little blurry, so let's keep moving on. So the ugly, what, what does that mean? Well, I took ugly to mean we were able to meet some of the expectations, but not all, but it wasn't it was, didn't give you that great feeling that, oh, we really succeeded in doing this. So I'm going to go to eastern Nebraska here. Um, determine the depth of quaternary alluvium for groundwater availability and the depth of the Cretaceous units in the area, which include the Greenhorn Ganeros limestone, Granaro shell, and the Cretaceous Dakota group. So 304M, 2018, and we used the Aarhus workbench. So here's a extraction. So the airborne sounding closest to this hole is the red line here, smooth model. Uh, we have the 16 inch and the 64 inch, so the short and long resistivity logs in there. We have the airborne uh, derived the DOI of where we're getting out of our uh, conservative and standard DOI band. And what we're seeing in here is kind of ugly. We see some sands and gravels, which are the, the yellows in here. We're seeing this green on Graneros, a limestone in there, but we're not catching a lot of this detail. And in fact, we're not even coming close to pulling out where those units are. Did we see a resistor coming through here that generally trends with this? Yeah, but we just couldn't see that variability in there to see pull out some of these sand zones at those depths. Is this, if you just look at the Airborne EM, is that sand? Is that Dakota? Where's the green home? So it matches okay, but it's a little ugly. Another eastern uh, Nebraska example. Uh, Quaternary uh, sitting on top of Cretaceous Dakota group and um, developed the aquifer within the Cretaceous group. So this is 2013. SkyTim 304, also workbench. And here's a cross section here, same color scheme. Uh, high resistivities are pinks, lows are blues. Um, here's the section in here, and here's the hole. And it was unsuccessful. So why? Well, we had suggested drilling in some of this areas here, the, in the Dakota, that are more resistive, but because of the landowner and the district and what they had to do, they actually drilled right in here. So as they entered from the sand and gravel, 
which is yellow up here, into the bedrock, they got into a siltstone that had zero yield. So this is ugly, not because of the geophysics, it's ugly because where they drilled the hole didn't work for them. And they say, well, airborne didn't work for us. Again, you remember, it's the client's perceptions that do the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Eastern Nebraska, here's another example. Determine the depth of the Quaternary Alluvium groundwater um, glacial deposits. Um, this is 508 and 304. And Katie put this slide together, and this is an interesting one. So color scales are going to change. Here's some of the 2015 data. Um, a hole here, kind of this green 20 ohm meter. This is down in the Dakota. I've got the well log next to it. This was the 2018 data. A little different color scale. So it's moved the, the orange, but we see this, this bright orange segment in here. Next to this blue, this is mudstone. So that's the distance from the hole, pretty close, not bad. The resistor was full of quartz, silt. It had zero yield. But it was a resistor in the Dakota, right? <laughs> it wasn't sandstone. It was siltstone, zero yield. The whole point is, is did we really take into account where we were in this depositional system of the Dakota? Probably not. Moving along, let's go to the bad. Okay, this is where it didn't work at all. The last one I showed you, the resistivity worked, but it was the wrong thing, completely. West Texas, uh, basically chasing these marginal waters that I talked about at the beginning, Quaternary, Triassic Dockham, uh, Dewey, Lake Formation over the Rustler. This is 508, 2014 vintage. So we're going to look at this. Here's some of the airborne EM sections, same color scale. So we got some conductive stuff on top. Oh, excuse me, reverse color scale, reverse color scale. And um, red's down in here. See this nice green zone in here. In fact, here's a blow up. Ah, that's where the Dewey Lake, that's the sandstone we're looking for in the Dewey Lake. There's been a couple cores in the area. That's what we're looking for. So we went in, we drilled it with a lot of money and a lot of drill holes and the lithology in here, this is all sandstone cemented with anhydrite. Hmm. Here's another vision. Resistivity's here. Colors match pretty good. Here's the uh, flow rates from the flow meters. See how they're white? That means there's no flow. The interpretation was completely incorrect. We interpreted a sandstone. It was a sandstone cemented with anhydrite. Zero yield. So, in the end, these things get a little fuzzy between the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it really comes down to, you know, the client's perceptions. Make it bad. What is it? The issue of resolution? Like the one example, flawed interpretation? Was the target poor? Did you accomplish the goal? So that's where it comes down to. So how do you be successful? All the things you've heard today. Uh, Ford system modeling, pick the right system, knowledge of the geology, critical, and managing expectations of your client. So at that, I hope I gave you some examples. Not everything's rosy, uh, but that's kind of some, some real holes that we've had to drill based on the Airborne EM.